Hello and welcome to the Saturday Post for Patrons. And um, some of you will maybe eventually see it when I make it public in about a month. <laughs> well, or two, or three, or four. Don't you want it fresh? Anyway, okay, so um, today we, um, I want to look at Acts 15 and Galatians 2. So um, this week we've looked at Acts 15, most of Acts 15, and what's sometimes called the Jerusalem Council. And it's, of course, long been noted that there are certain similarities between what happens in Acts 15 and what Paul talks about in Galatians 2. So while we don't have uh, a Matthew version 2 uh, or Matthew volume 2, Mark volume 2, John volume 2 uh, to, to compare and contrast with Acts volume, with Luke volume 2 Acts, uh, we do have some comments scattered here and there in Paul that do give us um, something to compare and contrast with, with Acts in various places. Well, let's go ahead and do that with Acts 15. So Acts 15 seems to take place around 49. Uh, now, we can't fix this for certain, but we can, you know, if we take Acts somewhat straightforwardly, and in some respects, we don't have a choice, right? We don't have, we don't have any other options. Uh, we don't have other documents for most of the things in Acts. And so we are, we are more or less forced to to go with Acts, unless we have some strong reason to, to s suspect that something's, you know, different here or there. Um, and there are, of course, uh, some scholars uh, who propo proposed uh, quite different chronologies of Paul. Uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a fellow at Duke uh, who's done that. Um, there, there have been very different chronologies proposed, but uh, it seems to me that that we just don't have good reason not to basically keep with the chronology of Acts, is from a historical perspective. Um, now, probably the bedrock incident of Paul's missionary journeys uh, is usually considered to be when Gallio was proconsul of Corinth, because we can narrow down because of inscriptional evidence. Uh, we can we can narrow down the time when Gallio was in Corinth to around. 51, 52 in there, somewhere in there, about 51. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying give or take a year. Uh, from inscriptional evidence, we just know that that's when Gallio was in Corinth. And, of course, the book of Acts tells us about Gallio in Acts 18. And so um, it would seem that uh, the events in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 surely took place not too much before um, Paul was in Corinth. So we're talking basically 49 or 50. Similarly, um, the book of Acts tells us that Priscilla and Aquila arrive in Corinth when about the time that Paul is there, uh, around uh, 50, let's say, uh, because uh, Claudius, the emperor Claudius, has kicked the Jews, and I think probably Jewish Christians specifically, uh, out of Rome. Uh, so again, that fits really well, right? Uh, that Paul would be in Corinth on his second missionary journey not long after 49. All of that puts us about 49 uh, for the events of Acts 15. Okay, so um, what happens in Acts? Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch from their first missionary journey. There's a controversy at Antioch with Judaizers over Gentiles. That is to say that there are some Christians, I, I, I think, we should assume that these are Jewish Christians, or better, Christian Jews, um, who, who, who are teaching that the Gentiles must fully convert to Judaism, be circumcised, and start keeping the law of Moses uh, if the Gentiles expect to be in the people of God and to be saved. Now, this causes a great controversy at Antioch. At least that's what um, the book of Acts, the way the book of Acts uh, sequences this, sequences it. So Antioch officially, we get a very sense of officialness, sends Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, uh, where uh, the idea is let's get HQ to make a decision on this. Now, once they get to Jerusalem, there are Pharisee Christians there in Jerusalem uh, who advocate strongly for this, what I might call the proselyte position. Gentiles must fully convert to Judaism and become proselytes if they are to be saved and be part of the people of God. So the apostles and the elders meet in a, in a kind of Christian Sanhedrin, 
This is basically a Christian Sanhedrin we have going on here. Uh, Peter tells about Cornelius and how God gave the Spirit uh, to Gentiles and made no, no distinction between uh, Jew and Gentile Christian, purifying their hearts by faith, the same as he purified the Jewish hearts. And then Paul and Barnabas tell about the signs and wonders that happened on their missionary journey, uh, and then James renders a verdict. And the verdict is that as long as Gentiles will stay away from sexual morality and blood and things strangled uh, and meat that's been sacrificed to idols, um, then they're good. And I presume uh, there's debate, but I'm presuming that James is talking about table fellowship. Although some have argued, Ben Witherington comes to mind, have argued that, that uh, uh, this is the Noachic covenant. That is to say, this is about um, uh, keeping the basic principles given to Noah in his covenant after the flood. Okay, so that's Acts 15. We've done that all week. Um, and uh, these things have much, many of the same components, of course, of Galatians 2. The same players, the same arguments, the same uh, parties, you know, um, but there are some slight differences between Galatians 2 and Acts 15. So what happens in Galatians 2? Well, um, in Galatians 2, false believers have infiltrated, um, and they're pushing the circumcision of Gentiles. Is this the same? Ding! This is the same. There's only one difference, and that is, is that Paul believes that they are false believers. Paul doesn't believe that they are real Christians. Now, this isn't the way Acts presents it. Of course, Acts, Acts just doesn't make a judgment, right? They're in the church. Uh, they say they believe. Presumably, they've been baptized. Uh, and so Acts simply doesn't make a judgment call on whether they're true believers or not. But Paul, Paul has. Paul believes that these Judaizers are false believers, that they don't really believe. They're only, um, they're weeds among the wheat, so to speak. So, very similar. Uh, one of the parties uh, is in common to both accounts. Uh, the only difference is that Paul is a lot more conclusive on the spiritual nature of these uh, others. Okay, um, Galatians says, uh, Paul says that he went up to Jerusalem after 14 years. 14 years after his previous visit. Talk about the dating in a second. Now here's one difference. That Paul gives us the impression that this was largely a private meeting, which of course makes, makes sense uh, from a strategic standpoint for Paul. Uh, why would Paul want to uh, put everything on the line out in public before he's lined up his, his boats in private? Um, I would say that this is a, can't, a, a skillful thing to do. Uh, if you're trying to get a, well, I mean, this happens in Congress, right? If you're trying to get an important vote through, make sure you have the votes lined up before the decision comes to a head. And so Paul and Barnabas go down privately to the leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Cephas, and John, um, in order to make sure that everything is okay with the way they've been conducting the Gentile mission. So the, what is the timing here? Well, if Paul... Uh, went to Jerusalem the first time at about 80, uh, 36. We don't know for sure, but let's say 35, 36 in there. Then if you add 14 years to there, and of course 14 is seven times two, it could be a rough number. We don't know that Paul is is giving us the precise number. Um, two sevens, you know, it's a nice number uh, because seven is great. Um, so, but it still comes out of the same date. You see, you see basically that um, Paul's Paul's dating of the of his meeting with Peter and and Peter and James and John is about the same time as the Acts 15 meeting. By the way, um, it does not fit the chronology of F.F. F. Bruce's gift trip hypothesis. So F.F. F. Bruce um, hypothesized that uh, this private meeting uh, between Paul, Barnabas, and James and Peter took place in Acts 11 when they went down to Jerusalem uh, in order to uh, take uh, famine relief uh, in around the year 44. 44 does not, pit, does not uh, really fit the most likely chronology. Of course, he didn't take it as 14, I mean, it gets very complicated. He, he didn't take it as 14 years from Paul's previous visit. 
which is by far the most likely way I think the, it reads. Uh, he took it as 14 years from Paul's conversion, uh, which would put it about uh, 47 or 46. Um, um, and, and also, he's, he's probably being a purist about Paul saying it wasn't for another 14 years that I went up to Jerusalem. Whereas, um, uh, I, you know, Paul, I don't ha think there's a problem with saying that Paul may not have mentioned that in, in Galatians because it wasn't really apropos to the topic at hand. Well, you can tell that your brain, you know, my brain used to pretzel at these things. Uh, but the timing doesn't seem to fit F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's gift trip hypothesis. We also have to be careful about our impulse to harmonize. To some extent, of course, if, if it's easy to fit things together, well, of course, let's fit things together. But there's a point at which you're, you're, you're having to go to such a, you're having to twist so many pieces. There's a point at which you're having to twist so many pieces to make the things fit together that you should probably sit back and say, you know what, ancient history did not have uh, that kind of, uh, did not worry about that level of harmonization, and therefore probably I should back off and say, you know, the details aren't the same here, uh, but that's not the point. Um, I'll let you decide what you think about that, that sort of thing. Now, on, on this first trip, uh, in, in fact, the only trip mentioned in Galatians 2 at this time, uh, Paul and Barnabas take Titus with them. Titus, of course, is never mentioned in the book of Acts. Uh, I, did, I did have an acquaintance who thought that Titus and Timothy were the same person, uh, but I don't think that, I, I don't, that's not the way I read Paul's letters. It just do, doesn't seem to be the case uh, that uh, Acts mentions Titus, for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, notice the, I, the wording here is interesting to me. Um, Paul says that Peter and James, they did not compel Titus to be circumcised. They did not force him to be circumcised. I mean, to me, again, we're, we're basing a lot on little nuances, but it seems to me that the way that reads is that James and Peter still thought that the ideal would be uh, for Titus to convert to Judaism and become circumcised, but they did not insist on it. They did not force him. Um, and, and, and here's another thing that Paul says. They recognized that I was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews. I'm sent to the, to the Gentiles. Uh, again, this is not the way Acts, it's not the impression Acts leaves us. Acts gives us the impression uh, that Peter is, is uh, very much in on the ground floor of the Gentiles. And I've talked about this in, a, in another uh, patron video. What I'm getting at is, is that it's understandable that Paul um, emphasizes that he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter is not. Peter, in fact, I think Paul probably would, would almost laugh at you at the suggestion that Peter would be the apostle to the Gentiles. That's, not, uh, that's simply not the way Paul seems to view the case. And here in Galatians, he, he, he suggests that they agree with him on this. Now, again, one person emphasizes one thing. Another person emphasizes another thing. You know, it happens all the time. Um, uh, Paul says the one thing, you know, he, he, Paul basically says, and they agreed with me. The only thing they added is, is they wanted me to remember the poor, presumably the poor of Jerusalem, which Paul takes up a, a gift offering, right? Um, he, he takes uh, this offering to Jerusalem, fulfilling that uh, promise, apparently. But Paul says here, and they didn't add anything to me. The only thing they said is, Remember the poor, and I was going to do that anyway. You know, so Paul, um, and, and I think this is an important point. When they concede Paul, he, he points it out. When, when they agree with him, he points it out. This is important because when we get to the, the, the end of, of Galatians 2, he does not say, and everybody admitted I was right. I believe that Paul, at least initially, lost the argument that we're about to talk about next. Um, okay, so you can see that Galatians 2 is very similar in its content and its basic outline to Acts 15. We have the same people there. James is there. Peter's there. Uh, John presumably is there, the son of Zebedee. We have about, it's about the same date. You have a circumcision party, uh, not a party for circumcision, but a, a, a party that advocates uh, circumcision, a, a group. Um, uh, 
the decision of the leaders is the same. Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Okay. Uh, the main difference, the main difference here is public versus private. The impression we get uh, from uh, the book of Acts is that this is a somewhat public meeting. Now, it is a Sanhedrin meeting, right? It is the elders and apostles. Um, but uh, we get the impression that it's a somewhat official and a little bit more, I mean, Paul, Paul's, the impression Paul gives is that this was on the kind of the down low uh, going in there, uh, that there wasn't a real public, you know, maybe nobody even knew he was in town. I mean, you could read him that way. Okay, so what happens in the last part of Galatians 2? This is after the, this is definitely after the private meeting between Paul, uh, Barnabas, and James, and Peter. Now, the question is, is this after the Jerusalem council? Because if, if Acts 15 and the first part of Galatians 2 refer to the same basic event, then what we read in the last part of Galatians 2 must have happened after the Jerusalem council. So, what happens in the last part of Galatians 2 is that Peter goes up to visit um, uh, Antioch. And this would make sense, right? Uh, if um, if uh, James and Peter have decided, okay, the Gentiles can be saved without getting circumcised, you can hear James, I can hear James worry. Slippery slope, slippery slope, slippery slope. We've given them an inch, they'll take a mile. Now that we've told the Gentiles that they don't have to keep the Jewish law fully in order to be saved, they're going to take advantage of this. And even worse, maybe the Jews, Jewish Christians, will think, well, well, we don't have to do the law either. We need to make sure that we keep this distinction. The Gentiles have a different set of rules than the Jews do. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to send Peter. Peter, could you go up there and make sure that, that uh, this is not a slide, that this is not a slippery slope? I can, I can see James really worrying about this. So James goes up, though. Um, Peter goes up, and initially Peter thinks, uh, maybe, maybe Peter's thinking, this is great. We have Gentile believers, we have Jewish believers, and he's eating with them, which I, I suspect means the Lord's Supper, because uh, this is the communal meal they have, the agape, right? Um, Peter's eating with Gentiles. We are one in the bond of love. You know, everything's going great. And then some people come from HQ. Some people come from James. And they whisper in Peter's ear, Peter, what are you doing? You've got to set the tone. You're the apostle. You're the one to whom Jesus first appeared. Everybody's looking to your example. Do you know where these, you don't know where these Gentiles have been. You know, they might be unclean. You, and you know, they're sexually immoral. I mean, all Gentiles are idolatrous and sexually immoral. I bet they got this meat from a pagan temple. And, and you're just making yourself unclean and all the Jewish Christians are becoming unclean. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm over-dramatizing. It might not have been quite that way. Um, but the pre there is, these are prejudices, typical prejudices, I think, of, the, of first century Judaism. And certainly the people come from James and says, James, you can't eat with these Gentiles. It's against the law. And of course, Acts 10 says that, right? Acts 10 says, Peter, Peter says in Acts 10, I'm not supposed to eat with you people. Um, and so um, Peter withdraws. Again, I don't think Peter withdraws because he so much has a problem with it uh, as because uh, he's trying to do the right thing and HQ uh, has problems with it. James in particular, James. This is Jesus' half-brother. I mean, and you wonder, again, maybe I'm wrong. Forgive me, James, if I'm messing you up here. But you wonder why, you, well, you don't wonder why James didn't get along with Jesus while Jesus was doing his mission, you know? Remember, Jesus' brothers and, and sisters and his mother, maybe not his mother, but I mean, that they were outside. You know, Jesus, stop, you're embarrassing us. Get out, stop. Um, there, there's a, you at least get a sense uh, from some of the Gospels uh, that uh, Jesus' brothers didn't necessarily think that he was um, uh, that he was sliding a little on his standards. Maybe I don't know for sure, but I mean I, I get that impression a little bit. And so James is not okay uh, with Jew and Gentile eating together. Barnabas also withdraws. Why does Barnabas withdraw? My personal hunch, and again I may be wrong. My personal hunch is that Barnabas is trying to be conciliatory. That basically Barnabas, uh, being the encouraging guy that he is, he thinks, okay, we can work this out. 
we can figure out a way for Jewish and Gentile believer to have the Lord's Supper together. We can find a way for Jewish and Gentile believer to eat together. We can find a way. But um, let's play it by the rules for now, Paul. Uh, let's, let's go through due process. You know, God will work this out. Um, uh, you know, or, or maybe as I sometimes dramatize it, Paul, Paul, I know what you're thinking. Don't do it. Don't do it, Paul. Don't sit down, Paul. Paul, don't do it. And Paul gets up and says, you hypocrites. <laughs> Paul basically thinks this is a joke. This always reminds you, there's a vice presidential debate back in the, like, um, 1988, um, between, uh, a, um, a senator from Texas named Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle from Indiana. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's a famous line where Dan Quayle, for some reason, who knows why, compares himself to John F. Kennedy uh, because he's a young guy. And of course, uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, George Sr., Bush Sr., um, who is also running for president, um, he had compared Dan Quayle to John F. Kennedy, and so I suppose Dan Quayle was just kind of following suit. Well, Lloyd Benson has one of the one of the greatest put downs. Now, again, this is not about who you who you you know. I voted for George Bush Sr. and Quayle, so so uh, in that election. So so uh, this is not because I'm um, I'm being you know partisan here. But Lloyd Benson, you know what he says? He says, "Son, I knew J John F. Kennedy, and you're no John F. Kennedy." I mean, a great. Great, great, one of the greatest put downs. Um, and and uh, but anyway, uh, th this is kind of what I hear Paul saying here. This is a joke, Peter. You've never kept the law a day in your life. Good grief! I was a Pharisee. I would, and he says in Philippians three six, as far as the righteousness in the law is concerned, I was blameless. I tithed my mint and my cumin and my dill. You know, I didn't walk more than nine hundred and ninety nine cubits on the Sabbath. You know. I kept the law to the T, Paul, and you, you've never kept the law a day in your life, at least not to the standard of the Pharisees. And so basically, I mean, what, what Galatians records Paul saying is, how can you, who live like a Gentile, compel the Gentiles to live like a Jew? Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, he goes on in Galatians 2 there to talk about justification by faith. Who knows? This event God may have used this event to solidify the doctrine of justification by faith in Paul's mind. Because Paul, what does Paul come out of this with? Paul comes out of this realizing that these sorts of Jewish works of law, circumcision, food laws, purity laws, Sabbath observance, these purity laws are not what God is looking for in justification. There is one thing that God is looking for to justify the ungodly, and that is the faithful death of Jesus Christ on the cross and our trusting faith in the resurrection and death of Jesus uh, for our sins. That it is by faith that God justifies us, not by these works of Jewish law uh, that, that, that uh, James is so concerned about down in headquarters. And so this event, God may have used this conflict. I mean, again, I don't like conflict at all, but Look at how God has used, God, God uses this conflict. I think that God uses this conflict to send Paul and Silas off to Greece to bring the gospel to a whole new place and a whole new phase of, 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 Gentile, of the Gentile mission. Um, and God uses this event, I think, to solidify the doctrine of justification by faith in Paul's understanding. Really, really great things come out of this conflict, even though it's uncomfortable. Uh, for a short period of time here. Uh, well, okay, Paul likely lost this argument, I think, which is a reminder that sometimes you may, you may lose the battle, uh, but, but God plans to win the war. Um, God, God lets battles be lost. He often does. That um, it's not so much what happens in the short term, but what happens in the long term. But I think in Galatians 2, Paul almost certainly would have said, and they all agreed that I was right, if they had. I don't think they all agreed that, that Paul was right. In fact, I suspect that Paul was somewhat on the margins of the church for the next um, uh, 10, 10 years or 12 years. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Paul was particularly um, looked at well by the churches in Palestine for the next, uh, over the next decade. Well, again, I may be wrong. In fact, that's uh, there are those who would, so I'm going to talk about it in a second. There are those who would say that Acts 15 happened after this event. 
and that Acts 15 tidied everything up, and then Paul was great. Um, so that's possible. So let's talk about Paul and this Jerusalem letter. Remember the letter that James set, sends out at the end of Acts 15. Paul never mentions this letter, which suggests that either he doesn't know of it or he disagrees with it. I, I, I certainly believe that Paul disagreed with it. When Paul writes about meat sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, when Paul ta even in Romans, when Paul talks in Romans 14 about uh, such things, he never mentions this letter. I don't think Paul agrees with the Jerusalem decree. Um, I, don't, I, for, I mean, he agrees with the sexual immorality part. That's true. Uh, but Paul uh, basically doesn't think that there should be any of the uh, kosher boundaries uh, on Jewish and Gentile table fellowship. At least I, I, that's not the way I read Paul. Um, now, maybe, maybe he just doesn't mention it, and he actually does follow those rules. Um, I don't know. We'll find out one day when we get to heaven. Um, I would say, however, that the letter at the end of Acts 15 sounds like the solution to the Antioch controversy. So Jewish and Gentile Christian can eat together if Gentiles will A, be sexually pure, which of course Paul taught all the time, B, use the right meat at meals. Paul, on the other hand, has a don't ask, don't tell policy. Don't ask where the meat came from and be thankful. Uh, C, if they prepare the meat correctly, don't, drain the blood rather than uh, strangle it. And of course, a part of that is making sure there is no blood. Uh, this, uh, this sounds like the solution uh, to the uh, controversy at Antioch. Now, uh, so you, you, it, it, is, it is nice and tidy, um, the, the tidiest option for the dating of Galatians, and this is the evangelical favorite. Um, it, is, this is the even, the, it is the favorite position within evangelicalism to date Galatians as the earliest of Paul's letters. And so if you date Galatians uh, as uh, the earliest, then Acts 15 would take place after this controversy at Antioch. And the letter would be the solution to the controversy at Antioch. That's nice and tidy, um, and that, which is why it's the favorite, because it's nice and tidy and everybody comes out friends. Um, the, the problem with it, well, there may not be a problem with it. The, the question about it is uh, whether or not it is the most natural way to put together all the evidence. Um, but F.F. Um, F. Bruce is well known for this, this particular option. Uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas sound a whole lot less in conflict uh, in Acts 15 than they sound at the end of Galatians 2. Uh, that's, you know, so uh, Paul and Barnabas don't seem quite as unified. Uh, it, that is to say, the relationship between Paul and, Paul and Barnabas uh, in Acts 15 sounds more like the relationship between Paul and Barnabas at the beginning of Galatians 2 than it sounds like the relationship between Paul and Barnabas at the end of, of Galatians 2. Would, would Paul have come down to Jerusalem after Galatians 2 and very calmly and soberly, you know, um, just talked about uh, all the signs and wonders that he had performed? Maybe. I'm not, you know, again, I, I don't think that we have a a airtight argument one way or the other. But clearly the tidiest option is that uh, Acts 15 takes place after uh, Galatians uh, 2. Now, so this would mean that Galatians was written before the second missionary journey. And so that brings in another, and this is just complicated, isn't it? That brings in that whole question of when do we date Galatians? Um, and um, uh, I did mention, and I think it was probably last week or two weeks ago, I forget when, when I was talking about the North and South Galatian theory, um, that the way Galatians reads in chapter four, it sounds like when I visited you the first time, that word seems to say, I visited you more than, more than once already. And so, uh, again, it's very slim evidence to base anything on, but if that's the case, then Paul would have already been on his second missionary journey by the time he would have written Galatians. Uh, okay, um, now, so if Galatians dates to a later time, then Acts 15 probably syncopates and formal, formalizes a slightly longer and messier process. So now you can see where, you know, this is where basically the rubber hits the road. road. Do you think that the book of Acts has used some artistic license in the rendering of events. 
Um, or do you think that Axe is pretty much a blow by blow videotape? And so how you feel about that question is probably going to um, impact uh, the conclusion you reach on this sort of thing. So like I think uh, uh, one of my first patron videos I did, I talked about the question of whether Luke 4, uh, where, where Jesus goes to the synagogue at Nazareth and reads the scroll, whether that is Luke taking a little artistic license with um, Jesus' visit, visit to Nazareth and Mark, which, which seems to take place a little bit later. Uh, we talk a little bit about in that same video, by the way, it's not, it's not publicly available, it's still only available for patrons. Um, that video uh, also um, uh, talks about how Luke 24 uh, and Acts 1, you know, in Luke 24, we have no, no sense of there being 40 days, and then in Acts 1, there are 40 days. The, the question that I'm getting at here is, and this would have been perfectly acceptable for ancient history writing, um, uh, to, to, to move some things around in order to get the point, because the point was what was important uh, in ancient history and biography more than uh, the precise chronology or, or details. Well, so this is where a lot of it lies. Whether you think that, is it possible that Acts 15 gives us a more uh, artistic uh, presentation of what was actually a little bit longer process, a little bit messier process, or, or is it pretty much uh, a, a blow by blow. And that's basically where you, where you fall on that question is going to determine your, your sense of this thing. Okay, so um, the, the Jerusalem letter on this scenario would indeed give what the end result of all these controversies were. It just wouldn't have necessarily have happened at that time and be done. And you can see where Acts, uh, where Luke, trying to be economical in the way that he presents the story of the early church, where it, it just it just works a whole lot better to present all that whole issue in one chapter rather than to have it pop up from time to time later on. He wants to get on with his story. Again, I'm not saying that's the case. Um, I'm just explaining the, the various scenarios and how they play out. Um, so this verdict, it, it, on this scenario, the verdict will have emerged at a time later than Paul's meeting with private meeting with James and Peter. Okay, wow, I've run out of space, but man, I've talked a long time, haven't I? So uh, you'll have to decide what you think. Uh, is Acts 15 basically the same as the Galatians, early part of Galatians 2 meeting, or is Acts 15 after uh, Galatians 2? A and connected with that, is Galatians the first letter Paul wrote, or is it a letter that Paul wrote a little bit later into his missionary journeys? Well, there you have it. Um, some things to think about, things that make you go, hmm. And we'll see you next week with Acts uh, 15 and 16.